um, we had a conversation with people from the Department of Mental Health um, about um, orders of non-hospitalization. One of the, when we asked for Act 80, was it Act 82 box? Uh, in one of the reports that we asked for an evaluation of the mental health system, we asked for a uh, second opinion on that, an outside opinion. And one of the suggestions was that our current <coughs> support system, or our system, or lack of system for orders of non-hospitalization uh, were leading to, was leading to a sort of circular movement in an untherapeutic way of patients. So we're going to talk about we sat with um, Katie, with our lawyer, and asked her to draft sort of a, the bones of a committee that will make some recommendations yeah. to us next year before session. All right. Let's have, uh, why don't we have Katie come up and go through the bill with us. And um, if you're going to be team testifying, you can just leave both chairs there. Yeah. Um, so, can we make a can we make a chair for him here by the door? Yeah. He has a wheelchair we right next to you sit right next to the door. I need to see it. I'm just looking at all the standing. Yeah. Hi, Quarters. Hello. Good morning. Good morning, Katie. Thank you for um, the work, all the work and the meetings that went into this. Why don't you walk us, walk us through it and uh, tell us what Tell us what's in here. Sure. I haven't seen it yet. Uh, Katie McGlynn, Office of Legislative Counsel. Um, so as the chair said, we met with some folks from the DMH team, and we talked about creating a study committee focused on orders of non-hospitalization specifically. Um, so um, this language just sets up that study committee. In subsection A, we're creating the study committee to examine the strengths and weaknesses of Vermont's orders of non-hospitalization. And then in subsection B, we go on to list the membership of the study committee, including the commissioners of mental health um, and of public safety or their designees, the chief superior judge or designee, a member appointed by uh, Vermont Care Partners, a member appointed by VOSS, a member appointed by Vermont Legal Aid's Mental Health Project, a member appointed by the executive director of the Department for State's Attorneys and Sheriffs, uh, the Vermont Defender General or designee, an individual who was previously under an order of non-hospitalization appointed by Vermont psychiatric survivors, and a family member of an individual who is currently or is previously under an order of non-hospitalization appointed by the Vermont chapter of NAMI. And we invited representatives of everybody on this group, I think, to come in today because this is a proposal no one's seen before. We didn't invite BPS. Big pardon? You did not invite Vermont Psychiatric Survivors. I thought we did. Nope. Oh, okay. Well, I'm sorry. That didn't. I'm glad you're here. The next subsection has to do with the powers and duties of the committee. The committee is to examine the strengths and weaknesses of Vermont's orders of non hospitalization and may propose a pilot project that seeks to redress any weaknesses and build upon any existing strengths. And then we go on to have the specific asks of the committee. Uh, first, the committee has the responsibility of reviewing and understanding existing laws pertaining to orders of non-hospitalization, including Act 114. Second, reviewing the 2017 Treatment Advocacy Center report entitled Reimagining ONHs, um, including the um, effectiveness of each of the recommendations in that report. The third ask is reviewing existing data pertaining to orders of non-hospitalization, um, specific to both people who are entering the system um, through a, the civil door, through the forensic door, um, in subdivision C4. If it's appropriate, we're asking the study committee to propose a pilot project for the purpose of improving um, the effectiveness of orders of non-hospitalization. And at the top of page three, if it's appropriate, we're asking the study committee to recommend any changes necessary to improve orders of non-hospitalization. And lastly, we're asking the study committee to identify any statutory changes 
necessary to implement recommended changes to orders of non-hospitalization. So those are the responsibilities of the committee. In terms of assistance, the committee has the administrative, technical, and legal assistance of the Department of Mental Health. They're responsible for a report that would be due November 1st of this year to this committee and to the two, one committee upstairs, just House Health Care. Um, and then in terms of meetings, the commissioner or the, of mental health or the commissioner's designee is to call the first e meeting on or before August 1st of this year. Uh, the commissioner of mental health or designee is to serve as the chair. The majority of the membership constitutes a quorum and the committee shall cease to exist on December 1st of this year. So it's a, a limited time study committee. And then the last paragraph has to do with um, compensation and reimbursement to folks who are not otherwise compensated um, through their um, formal employment. And that's the standard That's standard language. language. Yeah. <clears throat> I have a one suggestion for language we didn't put in. Okay. Um, examine the strengths, the weakness, well, whatever, and improvements. It's improvements to the uh, mental health of the patient. I don't know how that's that's awkward phrasing, but that's okay. the improvement. Are you in? Um, well, the you are are in creation. creation. I think we need to. Um, if that's the. If that's the. That's the point of the. Right. Of the. I'm just not sure with where you are. Are you well, in the first paragraph? I, right I want to add that to creation, and then there's oh, a couple of okay. places where it says shall improve. Okay. And so it could be improved for. You know, it depends on whose experience it is, but we had to maybe talk about that as we have witnesses. Sure. Any questions for Katie? <coughs> nope. Okay. I know you're going to be with us for a little bit. I will. I'm going to take some testimony from people who would hopefully be involved in this. Um, Good morning, Fox, Deputy Commissioner, Department of Mental Health. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to just speak to this briefly. I know we have a long list of folks, uh, mm -hmm. so I will be brief. Uh, and I also know that this is also very new, uh, fresh as of, you know, the last few hours even. <laughs> um, saw it this morning. Like, yes. We've been thinking about it. Um, mm -hmm. And so uh, I will also ask that, you know, uh, some time to, to, to uh, digest some of this and, and come back with other comments from the rest of our department. Uh, however, our initial thoughts are um, that orders of non-hospitalization uh, come up in various uh, places uh, throughout the system of care, uh, have been seen as obstacles to, to care for some folks, uh, have been seen as, I think there have been some folks who have described them as uh, being very helpful and others who have found them to be extremely detrimental. Uh, and so Can I, I think, stop you for a second? Sure. I, I think just pointed out to me that we did allow two hours for this. So in fact, you could do a problem, make a problem statement oh, there if you, you wish. <laughs> so it would be clear to the right. I couldn't imagine it's good for all these people for one hour. I think. No worries. I, I'll Thank still you. keep my, my comments okay. fairly brief. Um, but uh, as I was saying, uh, uh, there are varying opinions about uh, orders of non-hospitalization, uh, and I think that uh, moving forward with a committee of this this membership uh, to pull together to really look at orders of non-hospitalization, how they are operationalized, uh, and try to alleviate and mitigate the negative pieces of an order of non-hospitalization. Uh, I think, you know, as a state, uh, one of the pieces in, in statute is that we try to move, uh, continually move towards a non-coercive uh, system of care. Uh, and to that end, one of those pieces needs to be looked at is orders of non-hospitalization, because that is, by, by nature, a coercive piece of, of treatment. Uh, it's, it's ordering someone into some form of treatment. And so I think it's, it's imperative for us to take a look at that uh, and assess really the, the, the cost-benefit analysis around that uh, to people's health. Uh, because if, if our true goal is to try to move uh, to a less and less coercive system of care, then we really need to look at the pieces of our system that uh, do rely on for lack of a better term, coercion. And that would be both uh, orders of non-hospitalization, which this addresses, but also just the commitment, EE e. process, et cetera, both civilly and forensically. Uh, those are both also, again, coming back to the term coercive. They are by nature coercive. Uh, so I think it's uh, imperative uh, and, and a major responsibility of the department uh, to take a look at these things to make sure that uh, they are actually truly 
helpful and beneficial to the people who are, are being placed under an order, uh, in this case, an order of non-hospitalization. Uh, so uh, as it is written now, the department is in support of this uh, legislation uh, and would look forward to um, uh, the recommendations from this committee. Thank you. Questions for Fox? There's an excellent description of this at the beginning of the, is that the Act 82 report? Yes. Yeah. It was the best one I've seen, so if you need to take yeah. a look at that. In fact, maybe Faith can paste that on our website. The description of the orders of non, I'll, I'll talk, talk about it, get some information. Okay. Thank you. And also, I want to make sure we add the psychiatric survivors to our list of people I, that want to talk about this. Yeah. There's, for that be so willing, there's a person information. nominated by the psychiatric survivors on. Yeah. Was, okay. But I didn't, uh, uh, apparently, not. we did not invite psychiatric survivors yeah. today. They saw it. They're here. I want to make sure they're connected. <laughs> okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, Karen Barber? She is actually currently uh, in another uh, committee. Okay. Unable to testify today. All right, Sandra Steingard, Dr. Steingard. <coughs> Good morning. Good morning. Thank you for coming in. Sure. I do. I just have some brief remarks, but I did write them down. If you, okay. Yeah, we we them? I sent them in an email last night. They're on the Okay. Fine. Okay. So, well, thank you very much. My name is Sandra Steingard. I'm the chief medical officer at Howard Center and have worked in the Vermont public system since 1993, at Howard since 1995. So I do have a lot of experience as a psychiatrist in that, in a community mental health center in working with people that are on orders of non-hospitalization. And basically all I was gonna say is I did, I'm not a big fan of the Treatment Advocacy Center where Mr. Stetton works, but I was, um, I thought he captured the system well. I thought he captured some of the frustrations that we feel, some of the problems um, in the system. And I was heartened that he can, emphasized. Can you tell me who Mr. Stetton is? He's the one that sure. wrote this report. I'm, I'm going to oh, comment okay. mostly on the. Okay. Um, Thank you. Yeah, okay. So I'm, I'm mostly commenting on that report. And mm -hmm. I just wanted to say, from my perspective, I do think he captured a lot of the problems. And, you know, I was thinking of like better synonyms to absurdity or mm -hmm. Kafka-esque. Mm -hmm. But that is often how it feels, that it says one thing, but it's not really what it does. And whatever side of the equation you are on coercion, it, that lack of, um, that sort of double message, I think, is, is problematic. Maybe you and could sort of take us through the process as you see it and where you see the problems. Well, so he talks a lot about the criminal court and what we've been seeing in recent years, because there are two ways that someone can end up on an order of non-hospitalization. One is they commit a crime, they go through the legal court, and someone has determined that the person is either not competent to participate in their defense or was insane at the time, criminally insane at the time of the offense. And what that does, this is a non-lawyer talking, but what I think so happens, yeah. this okay. yeah. so what that does is to put the system in a bind because, for instance, mental health court, which is, I think, a really good remedy for people who have committed crimes and their <coughs> mental health problems, or there's also drug court people think have contributed to it, and so there's a big move to try to help them with that as a way of avoiding jail, which doesn't seem to be a good remedy. And I think it's a really good program. But in order to get into mental health court, you need to be competent. And so if you've been found not competent, you can't go that route. So it, this like this is a problem. And sometimes I feel that putting the person on the O&H is a way to clear their, their decks. And there's no real thought about whether it would happen. And believe it or not, there could be people that have some psychiatric diagnosis, but the treatment that they go to isn't necessarily connected to whether, to mitigating their risk for committing a crime again. And um, so now they're sent for some treatment, um, and as the person, the agency is designated by DMH to sort of be the ones that kind of, you know, uh, hold this order and act it out. But, what they're doing may not necessarily have any impact on the risk of criminal behavior. 
Now, when you when the order is up, or if the person fails to comply with it, they don't come into treatment, or they're using substances. The only remedy right now is to tell the Department of Mental Health that they're not in compliance with their order. But what's linked to that is to say that this is going to be a person who meets the statutory requirement for a person in need of treatment, which is kicks in the whole civil commitment process. And so let's say the person is using, they're technically not in compliance with their order, but there's no evidence that they're dangerous. And someone may not have evidence of dangerous, but may still be at risk for committing a crime again. So here you have this thing that you feel responsible for, and you want to, you know, do due diligence to everyone involved. But it just doesn't make sense. The things don't add up. And I think it puts um, the agencies in a in a very funny position of either sort of ignoring something. You got to use the designated agencies. Yeah, yeah, who are the holders of it, you know, of ignoring this order or just, you know, or I don't know. It, it's hard. And I think it's also, so that's one area. Now, in the civil commitment area, um, there's similar kinds of problems because someone may come out of the hospital, they're on an order, and there's going to be this standard language, you know, you have to comply with treatment, you have to live in a place agreed upon by the agency, you need to abstain from substances. Um, and these are things that sort of people have decided might mitigate their risk of becoming a person in need of treatment, because these are people who got there by being a person in need of treatment. But again, these things, um, and I think substance use is a common one, Someone may start to use, someone may start to, you know, we, we have like in my field good drugs and bad drugs. I mean, they're all psychoactive drugs. And so there's psychoactive drugs that people like to take in these instances. And then there's the psychoactive drugs that they don't want to take, the ones that we prescribe. And so you have people who may be choosing the ones they want to take, not taking the ones we think they should take. But they may not be dangerous. It could, it, you know, there's a many, many factors that lead to a person being a risk of harm to themselves or others. And so here they are not complying with the order, but we're asked to say that they are dangerous. And we're very bad at predicting that. Once you get out, I think we're, the studies will say we're pretty good at predicting for 12, maybe 24 hours. But we're not really good at predicting three weeks out, four weeks out. And so when I go into court to testify, I'm being asked, <coughs> when do you think they'll become dangerous again? And the honest answer is, I don't know. I can refer back to what happened before. And this is why everybody, you don't need to be a psychiatrist. This is why everybody's worried. But I can't tell you with medical authority that I know that they're going to be dangerous. I think, I mean, we'll hear from NAMI. I think it's very confusing for families because they're very worried. They've seen what's happened before. They're saying so-and-so is doing X, Y, Z. Those have been the ingredients to get this happening. Why aren't you acting? And again, either we will go forward with the case, and it may or may not, the person may or may not be in the hospital, or we have a family feeling that we're dropping the ball for their loved one, and, and there's a lot of concern all around. So he, I thought he captured a lot of it, and I, I like that. I mean, the other thing that I was going to say is that his remedy is, is clinical work. So I'm a psychiatrist that's talked a lot. I mean, I do prescribe mm -hmm. these drugs. I think there's a time and place. But I've also been talking a lot about their limitations. And I continue to believe in their limitations. And we've been talking about what I think every good clinician knows, which is relationships. And I thought what was fascinating in this report is that he's really talking about relationships. What he's bringing in is this thing that he calls the black robe effect. And he's basically, the he calls the involvement of the judge is called the black robe Oh, effect. I thought you said class. Yeah. Uh -huh. Which I had, I, was, I, read, I read that. Yeah, yeah, I wasn't familiar with that term. And I, you know, it, it seemed like it had like face validity to me. I think sometimes there's the doctor effect. I'm an authority figure. I mean, it's, it's, called, the white it's coat, often not it's called the white coat effect. I but yeah, yeah. But I, see that, that's my problem. I don't wear one. So, um, but still, I'm like, looking for a blue blazer effect. They <laughs> <laughs> so got this suit, guys. But the the thing.
thing is, is that, you know, having worked in the system for a long time, I mean, really when I have someone on order, I'm talking to them about what they want in life. And I'm trying to find, it's terrible to be coerced. It is a horrible thing. And it's a, it's a conundrum to be a doctor and to be an agent of force. And so I've spent a lot of time thinking about if one can, if those things can even live side by side and how can they do that. And for me, the answer has been to de try to develop a relationship. And the relationship is based on transparency and respect. And so you can say, yes, you're being coerced. I get it. It sucks. But um, what do you want? And then how can we find places of being in alignment? And usually we agree that going back to the hospitals is not a good idea. Where we don't agree is what are going to be the ingredients to get there. But all I can say, it's a relationship. And I think really what he's talking about is bringing in another relationship. I think the idea of having this, because I hadn't seen the bill, you know, having some study group and um, getting different ideas about, you know, because you're going to hear from other people who are going to come at this from a different perspective. And I think that's really important because we only know what we know from our own perspective and you need to hear this but having some group that might come to look at the absurdities we we tried this a while ago i was on some committee but i think it hasn't happened yeah. and i think an agreement might be training on how the the people in the designated agencies might be able to work with people who are not interested in the help that we have to give and are there best practices and ways of engaging with people and um, because in the end I think force is a very very limited tool and he actually says that on page two that in Vermont people are talking about wanting to extend the, for, the, the laws that govern forced medications and I was I was shocked to see that he was saying that's not really what it's about and at least my read of it as you go further is he's saying it's about relationships so Oh, one other thing I wanted to say that I put in here is we actually tried this with Judge Crawford, Jeffrey Crawford, uh, many years ago. He said, why can't we use, when someone's going on a revocation so they're not complying, and the ultimate remedy right now is to be in court and to put them back into the hospital. But there's all these things called status conferences that happen, and we're not involved with the clinicians, the patient. And he said, why can't we use those the way we use mental health court? Bring the person in. We'll talk. This is what... He wanted to do. He's a very wise person, as we all know. And this was the problem. No one came. <laughs> because there, and there was no way to bring them in. So I mean, again, there's going to be a study group. These are going to be the things. But we do have some experience of doing that. Thank you very much. That was um, really interesting. And we'll make sure that we, I, I'm going to ask Faith to excerpt that article and put it with the rest of our uh, evidence for today. What's okay. that article? Thank you. Get it online. Yes, it's online. Yes. Um, it's, it's, do you know what we're talking about now? Yeah. Mm -hmm. At the beginning of, I think it's the IP2 report, there's a, a preface by yeah. Mr. or Dr. Stein, Steingard. Can you spell it, please? Oh, it's S T E I N. My name or his name? Oh, the author's name. Oh, it's Your name. S, S T E T T I N. Brian Stetton. And I know that uh, DMA does Yeah, I think it's, it's on the IP2 report. It's on our, it's on our yeah. website. It's on our website. It's it a separate is. report from the Act 82 report. Yeah. Okay. But it's also on our website. All right. And we can repost it up. for today. Okay. Thank you. I'm going to skip around a little bit. Uh, Lieutenant Lamont was here before I was this morning. <laughs> and I'm sure he's got things to do. Uh, good morning. Good morning. Thank you for coming in. No um, we asked you here to talk about um, sort of law enforcement's experience of orders of non-hospitalization. Unfortunately, it happens that way sometimes. And why don't we introduce ourselves to you? You're not in here very often. Caroline? Ginny Lyons, Chittenden County. Good morning. Debbie Ingram, Chittenden County. Good morning. Claire Ayers. Dick McCormick, Windsor County Senate District. Good morning. Ann Cummings, Washington County. Um, so uh, my name is Morris Lamoth. I'm a station commander in St. Albans. Um, I've been on with VSP almost 19 years. Um, most of my time has been in St. Albans. Um, I have some. I have five years in Chittenden County, but again, most of my time is St. Albans. Uh, just a little bit of background. I have an embedded mental health crisis a crisis worker. Has been in my office now for about a year and a half. So I have a little bit of time with that, and it's by far the best resource I've ever had in my office in 19 years of work. So um, we use them almost every day. Um, and it's just, again, the best resource I've ever had. So I'm a big, big believer of this, of any program that involves mental health. Um, 
we used them yesterday with the gentleman that was killed up in Berkshire, and every day we have something that works. So um, as far as my experience with this stuff, Franklin County, as somebody alluded to a couple minutes ago, we are really inundated with a lot of issues that I think are um, singular to Franklin County. Um, we have a lot of mental health issues, we have a lot of suicide issues, we have alcoholism issues. Uh, I met with DCF the other day, we have more children in DCF custody than Chittin County, and it doesn't make sense with the population difference, but we do. Um, so we have a lot of stuff going on. So non-hospitalization non orders are big in Franklin County, uh, so we do deal with them quite a bit. Um, if you are asking how we deal with them, um, if we have an order to pick up somebody, which happens quite often, we get uh, orders that are sent to us from mental health, and the pickup orders, um, it's changed a lot since we had our mental health embedded worker. Uh, we, we lean on him quite heavily for his, for his advice because he is the expert, we're not the expert in this field. We do get some training uh, now, it's, it's continually growing uh, in the academy and it gets pushed out to troopers on the road. Can I, um, can I interrupt yeah. you for a second? Absolutely. That is, it's mandated now, is that, is that not where really we put some resources into that? Yes, it is, it's growing every year. Um, mm -hmm. It's mandated at, in, the, in a way that's great right from the academy level, the hours are growing mm -hmm. and the troopers that are no longer in the academy because they're on the road, we, it gets pushed out to us every year. Great. It's called Power DMS. It comes across on an internet type uh, training. You have to sign off on it. It's timed, so you know you're, you're actually doing it, um, and it's tested. Um, so, but it, the hours are growing every year. So, but again, uh, for me, it's a little. I have the benefit of having this gentleman in my in my office every day. So, uh, we game plan and decide how we're going to um, approach the situation, and we lean on him for his expertise and training and education. How we're going to deal with serving this order. Uh, but these are not easy orders to serve. As we're probably said, there, you know, there are somewhat coercive sometimes. And, um, we go out and we, we try to speak to family members first if we can and decide uh, how we're going to uh, issue this warrant to take somebody into custody. Um, typically they go very well. Um, sometimes they don't go so well. Um, I kind of look at them as um, it's a necessary evil. It's, a, it's, a, it's an order that has to be served. So uh, we have had some cases where um, there's been a lot of talk about the dangers of uh, taking somebody or taking somebody into custody. So um, we've had to do some serious thought on some. We had um, some where we've actually um, discussed bringing it into making a tactical situation, um, and, and we've actually done a couple of days worth of planning to make sure we didn't get to that, that step. And it's worked well, but it takes some real. You real call it a tactical situation. Tactical situation where we've talked about using much more aggressive Force. efforts to get somebody else that's made threats, severe threats, and knew we were coming eventually. Mm -hmm. um, but with some plea planning, we can usually get around that. But that's not always the case. But. So uh, you have someone in your office you're working with. We do. And you, uh, do you, are you also um, you're working with the DCF in this? So if a social worker has a need for your assistance, you go along with them and is that the linkage with the person in your office or so is it just it happens both ways or is there that linkage that happens after just the process i guess so with our mental health worker yeah and how they how they might link with dcf so our mental health worker is in my office every day yeah. so he reports us dcf um we also have a we have a connection with them. Mm -hmm. We have a Northwest law enforcement um, group that we started as well. So DCF has, an, has a person that's assigned to that. So they, uh, they call us um, typically once a week. We meet and we did, they give us a list like this morning while I'm here at 845, they're going to take three kids out of a house. So we know that's coming. So um, they have a person that, from DCF that came to our office on Wednesday and advised us what's happening today. So we have troopers that are making made a plan yesterday and they're going out this morning to do that. Um, so we're very integrated with DCF as well because of the number of uh, these type of cases that we do regularly. And then is there, um, <clears throat> let's remove the kids. And, uh, you wouldn't be involved in working with the family, but are you involved in working with the family after that? So we, People I am not. left in the house. So our, again, our, our um, crisis clinician yes. uh, is multi-purpose for us. Okay. So we use him for everything and that's part of what we offer that as well. We'll bring him up and he'll try to de-escalate because their obviously emotions are high in any situation, but that's one of them. Yeah. And he'll, he'll offer his assistance. Then he, one of one thing he does that he tries to get them continued care through NCSS. He'll mm -hmm. offer them, uh, you know, he's, he's more of the point of the spear, I guess you would say, for that initial um, contact. 
but he'll offer them down you know, suggestions for the next day, the next day, the next day. Sometimes they take it up, sometimes they don't, but we're finding that more and more they are continuing that service. So, they want their kids. Yeah, and um, and they you know they realize that um, a lot of these people have actually had prior contact with NCSS. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of people have. I mean, it's not just the kids, the people that are losing their kids, or the people that we arrested, but people have had prior contact with NCSS yeah. at some point in their life, and he just reinitiates that contact. Um, it's a phenomenal program. So, um, but he, uh, yeah, so we use them all the time, and again, so. Uh, we are very uh, busy with these type of orders and these type of big situations, and I, I can't, you know, I can't tell you they're fun to do, but we do them all the time. I'm sure there's a, there's a better way. I can't speak of how what happens once the order is in place, and I can't speak about how the process, um, like Doctor there, like Morning Fox says. I can say from my perspective that we deal with them all the time. They're not fun, and there's certainly uh, probably a better approach to it. Um, but when we get them, we're very black and white on them. They have to be served. We have to serve them. We just come up with a plan that's going to be less intrusive and the safest way to do it. So. Well, well, how does that work? <laughs> Who, someone decides that the person who's on an order of non-hospitalization is not taking their meds or is not behaving in some way or is, has a relapse. And then who makes the order? Who sends the orders from the court? or who? All we get is a final order that says this person shall be picked up. Yeah. How it gets to us, I don't know. We get that order. It simply says a law enforcement officer will take this person. Is that a judicial? Yes. Yeah, that comes from the judge. Yeah, we have no input on that. We, when, when it gets to my hands or our hands, yeah. the decisions have all been okay. made. All right. And, and how do you know if they're on an order of non-hospitalization or not? Or do you even know that? I have no idea. When it comes okay. to us, it is a, yeah. it is a done decision that's been made. Okay. Um, and that was a question that came up to us was um, something that came through the emails this week about me coming here was um, a condition of that if they take their medication or don't take their medication. In my 19 years, and I ran this up to Major Hopkins in his 30 years, neither of us could ever recall ever seeing a condition of release or condition of non-hospitalization that said they must take their medication or what if they don't. We've never seen that. We've never been put in that position where we would have to enforce that or potentially enforce that. But I can tell you that there are alcohol conditions like that. Mm -hmm. that somebody has an alcohol condition that says they can't have alcohol, the way those are enforced is they come to the office every day and they blow into a breathalyzer every single day. And if I, if I may, uh, you know, Morning Fox, uh, for the record, uh, it's, it's actually fairly common that part of the orders of non-hospitalization say, you know, we'll take prescribed medications or something of that sort. Uh, I think uh, what the lieutenant also speaks to is that of the community interacting with folks, you wouldn't necessarily have any idea who is on an order, uh, what those orders actually say, uh, mm -hmm. those kind of things. Uh, lieutenants, you know, kind of respond. To their their interactions with orders are generally after, like Dr. Steingard has testified, saying this person has not been taking the medications, they're a danger, and the court agrees and they revoke someone's order of non-hospitalization. It's that revocation that the lieutenant would receive if the person wasn't in court. Sometimes they'll be in court, you know, to testify and you know against the revocation for the only name. So, okay. so there are times that it would go out to the police and other times the person's in the court at, at that point. So you get an order mm -hmm. from whomever mm -hmm. to pick up a person, and what does the order say? They, to take that person to an emergency room? To take that person into custody for, the, for mental health, correct. Into custody, but where are you supposed to take them? Uh, typically, they will, they will take them to the emergency room. Okay. Where we met. And is it for another emergency evaluation? Correct. So they've the already been taken. already had one. No, it's it's actually, right, once the yeah. lieutenants receive an order from a court saying that someone's order of non-hospitalization has been revoked and to take them into custody, if we actually have a bed in that moment, and sometimes we do, if we're able, we're a party to the court process, we know that this court hearing is happening. Uh, and so if, if our understanding from our legal uh, uh, attorney generals is that this ONH revocation is going forward on, say, Friday, you know, that we can try and plan to go, well, let's not admit someone into that bed so we know we can just get them straight from court and into a bed so it doesn't have to go to an emergency room. But because of uh, the crunch on beds, frequently uh, there isn't a bed, and so yes, they would take them to a to emergency room. But they're already ordered hospitalized at that point, so there's no need for a new emergency exam or, or something of that sort because that court order basically has changed their order of non-hospitalization into an order of hospitalization. I see. Our, our goal is just to simply help get them into custody. And again, it's very black and white for us as we are taking somebody from their current location into helping them take them into custody. And how much of your workload is involved in just that sort of thing, getting 
getting people with mental health issues into into care? Uh, I wouldn't be able to put a number on it. I can tell you that the workload, the work involved in the actual process is the planning, because it could be a very volatile situation. That's, so it's it's not like a search warrant where it's a, you go up, you know, you do, yeah. these are very, because there is an element of mental health illness involved or uh, mental health crisis involved, mm -hmm. so I, we spend a little more time pre-planning and try to speak to mental health workers that know the history, and if we can, we'll talk to the family if we don't think that's going to be a safety issue and tipping people off or whatever the case may be, um, because we don't want to Know, make it more aggressive than it needs to be because these, you know, some people are paranoid, some people don't like police, and it kind of goes to the territory and you're taking them out of their house. Yeah. So we put a little more time into it than sometimes, most of the time it's very smooth. I mean, 99% of the time it's very smooth, but there are times when people meet us at the door and they're not exactly happy to see us. So. Any other questions for Lieutenant Lamont? My, my goal for today is to figure out how it works. I've just heard that it doesn't. My, my, my scope is very narrow because we have a piece of paper and we just simply act on that piece of paper, but the process getting that paper to us, I'm not familiar with. Senator McCormick. Do you usually get cooperation or do you end up having to actually physically overpower? Uh, no, it's, uh, it's, it's very rare for us to get to a physical situation. If you take some time and work with the mental health people that know their, their, they know the job, they know the process, they know what people are going through, typically we can, co we can use that and, and manipulate that into our approach. And it works so you're, well. you're a better worker does the talking? He does, he does a lot of the talking. Since we've had him in place a year and a half, it's been phenomenal. It really has. And it's just one person eight hours, 40 hours a week? Uh, he's, he's eight hours a day, 40 hours a week. Uh, we stretch that as much as we can. Okay. Um, and uh, you know, we're, trying to get, we're trying to get another position, quite honestly. Um, a second, a second sure. shift or night shift position, yeah. if we could, we would use it. Um, I think I heard that statistically a lot of the issues take place in the uh, non-traditional work hours, like <laughs> you know, before 8 a.m. and after. It, it always happens yeah. when, he's out, when he's out of town. It, it's yeah. just the way it is. <laughs> it, it, it is what it is. So um, I could use 24 hours a day, quite honestly. But, sure. but no, I, I mean, it, it does. There are always times that things don't go the way you planned it. I don't care how well you planned it. And it's, we're human, right? So people act differently than what you could plan. The best plan always falls apart. But for the most part, we've had very good luck. Besides dealing with people, the, when you're targeting people, does this, is this just a, a psychologist or a, what is his training? The crisis worker? Yeah. So he, so he was trained, he was a behavioral specialist is where he, what his background originally was. Um, he's, he is not a doctor level, he's not a psychologist. Um, and then we sent him to uh, crisis negotiation school, the FBI school, for a week. So he has additional uh, training through how to, how to talk to people, and, and it's a school that our crisis negotiators went through. Um, so he's, he's taken that, plus his years of work. Um, so this is a law enforcement officer? He is not. He is not. He's from not. the counseling He, he came from NCSS, yeah. and, um, but he had years with them as well uh, in the mental health world. Does he do training of your people? Does he what? Does he train your people? No. Like, when you have a, a thing at, at one in the morning, and mm -hmm. he, he's not working. He is not. We don't call. We have called him to get his advice if he's familiar with the person, but we use the on-call person from NCSS then. And this is when when I was testifying earlier, and so I didn't talk about street outreach in mm -hmm. various areas. Talk about embedded folks within mm -hmm. law enforcement. It's, this this model this event this it's been so that person so, might be it might it's probably a nighttime job anyway right That's yeah we work with yeah. the region and figure out you know from a scheduling perspective what, what would have the most impact so you any other questions for the time well, thank you thanks for your work thank, thank you very much welcome. judge Pearson thanks to see you again <laughs> good morning thank good you good morning. For the record, Brian Grierson, uh, Chief Superior Judge, speaking to uh, F203. And you know all of us, don't you? I do. Yeah. I do. It's good to be back here. Um, I think you've already received a lot of information. Um, you're going to receive a lot more this morning. I would ask the committee, uh, as they're hearing uh, all of the witnesses, listening to all the witnesses, to keep in mind the different uh, populations and processes uh, that are involved in this issue because, um, for instance, my, my sense was that the uh, trooper, to a great extent, was talking about emergency evaluation uh, situations that are different than non-hospitalization orders, which are the subject of this mm -hmm. uh, study. Um, Dr. Steingarten talked about mental health courts. Um, she talked about uh, forensic issues, meaning um, in the criminal proceedings, 
And so as you're going forward, you need to keep all of those straight. Forensic is essentially arising out of uh, criminal charges that have been filed. Uh, and they're never on ONH, right? No, okay. they are. They are. They are? The, the, the process. That's right. I did read that. <laughs> the process in the criminal court is if you are found incompetent, the next step is a what we refer to as a hospitalization hearing. But really, it's at that point that you're considering whether the individual needs to be hospitalized or subject to a non-hospitalization order. Um, that's purely through the forensic side. Other folks may come into a, the civil system through the process that the trooper was describing, emergency evaluations, uh, where they obtain a warrant sometimes after hours from the court, and the warrant is only to uh, take the person into custody to have them evaluated. Um, those cases, uh, depending on the level of, uh, depending on the incident or the circumstances, it could be purely civil, ending up in, a, in an emergency room for that evaluation, and then depending on the outcome, could go through a civil process that results in a non-hospitalization order. But if the behavior with the police officer on scene became so escalated, that could turn into a criminal proceeding and they have to go in a different direction. Um, the, um, the, the mental health court that um, Dr. Steingarten referred to it is really another population. They're individuals who are in the criminal uh, process, in the criminal system. They have not been found incompetent. They are generally speaking um, involved with low-level uh, offenses, um, public uh, offenses, retail theft, unlawful trespass, uh, sometimes referred to as, as um, nuisance offenses, just a cycle uh, of, of going in and out of court. And I think you've all read the newspaper articles that was happening in Burlington a couple of months ago, uh, where some folks, I think almost everyone involved, referred to that as uh, a failure of the mental health system. Um, whether or not you're of that opinion, it, it represents a different population of individuals who are in the criminal justice system, um, not in the mental health court, um, but still dealing with the same underlying issues. Um, when we talk about uh, the non-hospitalization study committee, uh, that could cover all of those, but I think it's important uh, that the committee understand how the person gets into the system um, to get on one of these non-hospitalization orders. Um, I, I look forward to the opportunity to, uh, to work with uh, the other members of the uh, commission. Uh, we touched on this to some degree about a, I want to say a year, year and a half ago. There was a short-lived commission on offenders with mental illness. Um, that one of the, one of the uh, recommendations that came out of that commission and made it, I think, almost to the end of the session last year, touched on this issue of at least the forensic uh, process. And by that I mean when someone is charged with a crime and they're found incompetent to stand trial, uh, at that point it's the state's attorney, generally speaking, and the public defender who are involved in the process. When you shift to the next phase, which is the hospitalization hearing, the, the consensus, I think, from everyone involved in the system at that point, the, the process should turn and does turn from punishment, which is no longer um, the issue because the person's been found incompetent, they're not going to stay in trial, to treatment. And it's at that point that the consensus was that uh, the Attorney General's office and the mental health project or legal aid who uh, for the most part are the attorneys involved in the civil process should get involved. And that was in a bill, I forget the bill number, I think it almost made it uh, through uh, the process. That in, in one sense is a small change, but I think the feeling was it could make a significant change because those are the same uh, individuals, uh, the Attorney General's office and the um, uh, mental health project or, or the legal aid folks who will be following that case 
through a non-hospitalization order, through a breakdown of the hospitalization order, enforcement of hospitalization order. What is a breakdown of a hospitalization order? Well, if they violate the terms of the order and it's the Attorney General's office uh, would then bring a, either a modification of the order or maybe the behavior has escalated to the point they may be seeking hospitalization. But that starts with uh, information available uh, I suppose it could be either side, but the, the initiative would then come from the Attorney General's office to, uh, if you will, review or reconsider th the, the level of treatment. Uh, that all happens within the civil process, but those are the individuals who, meaning the, the uh, Attorney General's office and the mental health folks who are going to be involved uh, in the long run on, on that um, on, on those civil proceedings and non-hospitalization orders. And so uh, I, I, I'm certainly not going to speak for everyone involved in that, but we felt that, that was a small change uh, that could make a, a significant difference uh, in, in, okay, let's talk about treatment. If, if we need, if the appropriate order is a non-hospitalization order, what should that consist of? Clearly the mental health project and the attorney generals have a better sense of what treatment is available and what's available in an individual community, um, and they're they're not necessarily involved in uh, the the circumstances that brought the person to that point. In other words, the state's attorney and the public defender they have different interests. So um, I think we did take a step in the right direction, and I would hope that through this uh, committee we can reinforce that and maybe find out why it, it did not what the problems were in going all the way through. But again, I go back to uh, the idea of whenever you're discussing this uh, subject, keep in mind the population you're really talking about um, because it's very easy to mix them. The, the, the trooper in explaining the process was accurate, except that it, it, only, it may only be the beginning of the non-hospitalization process. It's a whole separate procedure for warrants emergency warrants. Um, and it, a part of my time on the bench was spent in, in Burlington um, and presiding over the mental health court. Uh, so I'm familiar with that process um, and, and uh, the benefits that that court can bring. But again, it's not the same population that we're dealing with uh, in the, in, usually in the uh, civil commitment process, um, although some of them may have been through that, or the um, the forensic process where someone's found in common, even though they're in criminal court. They have mental, uh, suffering from mental illness, uh, but not to the degree that renders them incompetent. So um, I, I'm certainly glad to answer any questions the committee may have, but I, I think at this early stage, it's really important to understand where the person is, in what process, and how they move through that next phase. I'm not sure that I do, but I will before. I'll be sure to do I'll before I'll before one, I will yeah. say one thing. Uh, I, I haven't read the report in a while, but uh, they called it the, was it the Black Robe? The Black Robe uh, effect. Black robe effect. <laughs> we refer to it sometimes, or it's referred to uh, as the weight of the robe. The weight of the robe? Meaning that when you, when, when you have the robe on um, and you talk with someone, it sometimes has uh, an effect on them because of the appearance. So, way to the road is, okay. is a phrase that I've heard before. Just want to correct that for the record. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Any questions for Judge Gerson? <laughs> no, thank you. That was, that was thank thank you very much. Really helpful. So, I take it you agree that, you sh that judiciary should be part of this process? We're part of the process from beginning to end in any shape, form, no matter how it's confused. We're, we're there at some point. So, yes, we should be involved and we will continue to be involved. Um, and we look forward to working. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Jack? Yeah. Nice to see you. Yeah, come on. <coughs> I think you know all of us. Oh, yes. I've, okay. I've been here once or twice. You have. But I, get, I get the years mixed up now. That's old people talking. <laughs> I don't remember what happened. Yes. Um, good morning. Good morning. Uh, I'm Jack McCullough, Director of the Mental Health Law Project of Vermont Legal Aid. Uh, thank you for having me. Um, 
Okay, I'm actually glad to be anywhere. I've spent almost all week sick, and I'm, I'm better Ooh. now. So. Oh, gee, I'm glad you are, too. And I'm the only lawyer in my project who's not sick at the moment. So. <laughs> um, we all know the mental health system is in crisis for a multitude of reasons. And uh, I really like the idea. We greatly prefer if we can uh, have the opportunity to work with the Department of Mental Health on, in a cooperative way on things that can hopefully uh, improve the system, address some of those major problems. And um, maybe you could speak about what do you see as some of the major problems? Well, the things that we see a lot are, you know, the people being stuck in the emergency departments, the people uh, being stuck for weeks and months in hospitals, hospital beds, not because they're clinic, they have a clinical condition that requires it, but because they're ready to go and there's no place to put them. And uh, the issue of coercion is, I think, is a major issue. Um, but really, if we had, if we could get people out of the hospitals who don't need to be there, that would be a tremendous improvement to, to the system overall. Um, uh, I want to talk about, I didn't realize until very late yesterday that the focus of today was going to be on orders of non-hospitalization, but I do have some thoughts about that. Uh, the nature, legal nature of an order of non-hospitalization is essentially identical to an order of commitment. It's, the legal standard is the same. The fact that the person has to be mentally ill and a danger to themselves or others is the same as being committed to uh, any of the psychiatric units in the state. The only difference is that the, uh, there must be a condition where the person can receive treatment adequately, adequate treatment outside of the hospital. And the Supreme Court has recognized that uh, the same constitutional rights apply to orders of non-hospitalization and inpatient orders of hospitalization. Um, it's really burdensome on the mental health system and the judicial system. In, uh, I did a quick review of some of our statistics in 2017. And in 2017, in the Mental Health Law Project, we handled about 300 cases relating to orders of non-hospitalization. And these were mostly um, cases where the uh, uh, they're called ac applications for continued treatment, where the uh, person's order of non-hospitalization is expiring and the hospital, the state is applying to extend it for, for another year. Um, but there was a substantial group of them, maybe 50 or so, uh, orders ONH revocations, where the person is alleged to be violating the order and the hospital, the state is asking the court to send them back to the hospital. So that's a significant uh, chunk of our uh, caseload, both in my office, in the AG's office, and in the ju judiciary. And they take place in every uh, county in the state. Um, and even in the Act 82, Section 5 report, the uh, department admits <coughs> current ONH practices have very limited influence on only a small percentage of indi eligible individuals. And there's a real reason to question whether ONHs substantially contribute to improving mental health outcomes, making people better, helping people live in the community. About five years ago, there was a tremendous uh, amount of attention paid over in England when a psychiatrist who was considered to be the father of outpatient commitment or, or compulsory outpatient treatment in England published an article where he said, he looked at what happens when we put people on, uh, on their equivalent of an ONH. Does it help them stay in treatment? Does it help them stay out of the hospital? Does it make their lives better? And, and what he found was that uh, in well-coordinated mental health services, the imposition of compulsory supervision does not reduce the rate of readmission of psychiatric patients. 
we found no support in terms of any reduction in overall hospital admission to justify the significant curtailment of patients' personal liberty. Would you say this is a well-coordinated mental health system? I think we can make it a well-coordinated mental health system, and uh, I think that uh, if we don't, if we're not providing a well-coordinated mental health system, we should we should not be making up for it by unreasonably curtailing people's liberty. So my point is that we agree with the purpose of S203. We agree that we should be re-examining the use and effectiveness of ONHs. And we should consider what changes in the law are justified to, uh, to make the system work, serve the people better. It's, uh, I should say, in the list of people in the bill, one omission is the uh, state mental health ombudsman, Disability Rights Vermont, and we would encourage the community to add them. Okay. Uh, Ed Paquin, the executive director, is here this morning. Mm -hmm. um, You're also the ombudsman, is that right? That's, that, that was two positions. No, it's, it's, it's one person. Oh, it's, it's one person? Yeah. Okay. It's the, for the record, Ed. For the record, it's Ed Paquin, the director of Disability Rights Vermont, which is the state's designated protection and advocacy system. Okay. And the Vermont statute created, <coughs> excuse me, creates the position of mental health care ombudsman, and that statutorily is the protection and advocacy system. Okay, done. Um, we don't agree that the uh, <coughs> bill should specify that the Treatment Advocacy Center report be part of the study. I, uh, I'm concerned that that's really tipping the scales in one direction, because they're a very heavily pro-coercion organization. If the department wants this entity, this report, to be part of the study, it will be. There's no question about that. But I, I, I think it's uh, not making it uh, objective and impartial to include that uh, in the legislation. Which report is that? The one that, uh, the, the Stenton report that Dr. Oh. Steingart talked about oh. earlier. Okay. You know, don't think that should be part of the conversation? I'm sure it'll be part of the conversation. I think um, having, specifying that in the legislation uh, biases it in one direction. Okay. And I think there, I haven't. I, I think that's what brought this up to begin mm -hmm. with. Though. Isn't that a good thing? That we should wonder about the effectiveness of our system? Well, I do think we should wonder about the effectiveness of the system. And, and I'm concerned that uh, having that in the, in the bill, you know, maybe a small point, is, mm -hmm. is to say we're going to always have ONHs and, and we're going to fix them in a certain way that the Treatment Advocacy Center proposes, as opposed to having it wide open. And one of the questions clearly should be, should we even have orders of non-hospitalization? And so that's that's an observation for what it's worth. I okay. I didn't know that this that the that report was going to be part of this, today's uh, discussion, so I didn't go back and review that. But I can tell you, when Mr. Sketon was in Vermont uh, about a year or so ago, I was uh, had an opportunity to meet with him and with some other advocates, mm -hmm. and I think that. Uh, the one thing that you've heard about, this black robe effect, is, uh, and he talked about that when we yeah. met, seems uh, impractical to me. And let me tell you why that is. Um, when we were talking, he said that what he would like to see is a system whereby the, the way someone gets on an order of non-hospitalization is before that ever happens, they have to come into the courtroom, have a hearing with the in front of the judge. The judge explains to them how important it is that they, uh, they follow the terms of the order and, uh, and make sure they do what's right. And for one thing, I think it's a bit patronizing. Uh, but, but beyond that, the way orders of non-hospital, the way people actually get out of the hospital in practical terms is, I'm sitting in my office and I get a call from the AG's office. And, and they say to me, 
your client so and so is ready to leave tomorrow and we'd like them to agree to an ONH can you talk to them and I'll go to the hospital or I'll call them up more more often and I'll say here's what they want to do they want you want to get you out of the hospital tomorrow and they want you to agree to the terms of the order and I talk to them about all the terms of the order and explain to them what each one of them means if they have any questions and and they'll uh, they'll tell me yes that all sounds fine with me I've talked to the people already and I'm, I'm ready to go or they'll say well item number three I don't agree with can you get that changed or they're asking me to do a year but I only want it to be six months or three months can you get that changed mm -hmm. and uh, and then I call, go back to the AG's office and I say, we have an agreement or we'll have an agreement if you can make this change or that change. And it happens and then the person goes out the next day. The hospital doesn't even wait for me to uh, sign the order because they know once I've said we have an agreement, when they sign, send it to me in writing, I'll sign it, we'll file it with the court and that'll be in order, the judge will sign it and that'll be in order in the court. If the system has changed so that instead of saying your client gets to leave tomorrow, or even sometimes this happens, your client's leaving in two hours, if you call them and, uh, and make this happen. If all of a sudden we, the system says your client can't get out until they. Uh, go and sit in the courtroom in front of the judge and have the judge tell them what they have to do, people are gonna be stuck and uh, locked up in hospitals longer than they need to. And uh, I don't think the system can, uh, can, really, can really handle that. I don't think the judicial system can uh, can adapt to that very quickly because all the judges that I spend time in front of are very, very busy. And, and they usually don't have time to drop everything and, uh, and go through a kind of pro forma hearing with the patient. But uh, I'm, I'm very enthusiastic. I think that this, uh, this is an opportunity. You know, the chair knows that year after year after year i come in here the department of mental health is proposing something and i'm trying to hold back what they're doing because i'm trying to protect my clients rights if this is an opportunity for uh, for me and uh, other patient rights advocates and the department of mental health to be working cooperatively to do something that will actually make things better for our clients as I said, I'm very enthusiastic about that. Thank you. And I'd be happy to answer any questions. Questions for Jeff? Helpful, thank you. Is this okay? The people who are subject to all this, they, if I'm getting it right, they are, in some cases, have not been convicted of a crime. Yeah. And they've, they've, they've been in trouble. They've caused trouble, but that has not really been done. That the mental health issue is being dealt with first, but there's also people who there's also people who've been convicted. Um, there there may be people who've been convicted of something at some time, but the order of hospitalization does not grow out of a conviction of a crime. It does not. Okay. No, never. never. Um, and you, most of the clients that we deal with are people who are in the mental health system through the civil process. They've been brought in through an emergency exam. They've been through the process of an application for involuntary treatment. And then this is how they get to the order of non-hospitalization. So these are dangerous to themselves or others as opposed to criminals? Uh, allegedly, yes. Yeah. And, well, allegedly, they've been found that to be that by the court. Maybe. Well, some yes, some no. Some people, sometimes a person goes out on an order of non-hospitalization pursuant to an application for involuntary treatment where the hearing has not taken place on the involuntary treatment. They, uh, they've been there for a month or two and 
and they get ready to go without ever having had a hearing that commits them to the hospital. Um, I, what was I going to say? It is a system. Yeah. 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 Okay. Lots of things to be looked at. Thank you very Thanks. much, Jeff. I appreciate it. Lori Emerson. Good morning. Good morning. <clears throat> My name is Lori Emerson. I am the executive director of the National Alliance on Mental Illness of Vermont. So thank you for inviting us to be here today. Um, and also naming NAMI Vermont to uh, be able to designate a family member to be on the committee to review the orders of non-hospitalization. A lot of families um, are involved with this experience with orders of non-hospitalization and they may call NAMI Vermont um, because their loved one um, may not be complying and I, I think that this could be you know one of the issues that a, a lot of folks may have is they are responsible to manage their their own health and in doing so they make those choices so if they are at home and they don't follow treatment and a lot of times it's because of the factors of their illness that they may have severe anxiety they may have severe depression where it's very difficult for them to continue to seek that treatment that was ordered i think it's good that we can have that discussion um, within the committee about all of these different factors and one of the things that we really want to see is that we're not getting to that point that we need orders of non-hospitalization. We really need to look at the continuum of care that people are getting treatment in the community and the focus on mobile crisis teams um, embedded within uh, police departments, emergency rooms are very effective as well as peer support. And, you know, what we really see is what really helps people with their mental health is relating to other people with that same lived experience and getting that support. So if we're really concentrating more on the front end to help people maintain their wellness as opposed to getting to that point of needing hospitalization, we're going to really help to decrease those numbers. And you know, I agree with Dr. Stein that it's all about building relationships um, with caseworkers, with therapists that you're working with. And unfortunately, you know, I think some of the um, the challenges we have is the workforce with the designated agencies being able to provide that support. Um, with low wages, people are going elsewhere seeking employment. We hear from family members that you know their loved one has had three or four case managers in the past couple of years. How can you build relationships without that support? Um, so we really you know want to encourage the committee to look at the continuum of care. And I wasn't really prepared that this was going to focus on orders of non-hospitalization. Oh. Mm -hmm. um, but I did want to raise those points that if we're looking at improving the system of care, we need to look at the whole system. Um, you know, this is one component that uh, can help with those very few individuals who may continue their treatment um, through a court order out of the hospital, but it is very difficult for people um, be, due to some of the factors with their illness. And with the violations of uh, the orders, uh, family members do find themselves in that position what do they do? Um, and all they want is their, their loved one to get that treatment. And it's better to come from a point that it's voluntary. That's how they're going to manage uh, all of the symptoms that they may experience. And by forcing uh, medication treatment, it makes it a lot more difficult. Um, so we really appreciate, you know, looking at the effectiveness of the orders of non-hospitalization 
and um, having a family member involved who has had that experience. Thank you very much, Lori. Questions for Lori? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Devin? And um, it's Wilda, right? Yes. Are you, uh, would you like to testify for a few minutes after Devin? Sure. Okay. Good morning. Good morning. Devin Green, Vice President of Government Relations for the Vermont Association of Hospital and Health Systems. Uh, thank you for having us in here today to speak to this bill. Um, I'll be brief since, um, you know, we will need to digest this a bit more, but uh, we have placed improving the mental health system as one of our top priorities for this year. And I think any time that we can bring together all of these people, the judiciary, the healthcare providers, um, advocates, um, family members uh, uh, to work on any part of the system, we are happy to be involved with that. Um, so we look forward to participating. Um, and I think that's all I have to say at this point in time. That's great. Thank you. Thank you. I was just pointing out to me that I missed Karen Barber. Is Karen Barber here? Oh. I'm sure Fox said everything I would have said. Oh. <laughs> no questions for me. Okay, all right. <laughs> for some reason, I didn't think you were, and you were here, but you came in a little bit. Sorry, yeah, I was upstairs. Yes. yes. Are we good then? Yes. yes. Okay. Um, well done. And uh, my apologies for not having you on the list. It's just an oversight. <coughs> Tell me your last name, please. I've forgotten. White, like the color. Okay. So I wish I could begin by thanking you for inviting me, but I wasn't invited. <laughs> <laughs> and I think that's a problem. I think it's emblematic of what's happening in our mental health system, that the people who are most affected by it are left out, are not given a voice. Could you speak up just a little bit? Yes. I, so I think the fact that the Vermont Psychiatric Survivors was not invited to this, uh, to testify before the committee is emblematic about what's happening in our mental health system, and that is the people who are most impacted by it and its deficiencies um, don't have a voice in it. Uh, and while um, this particular statute does say that Vermont psychiatric survivors can appoint one person with experience of a uh, order for non-hospitalization, um, you know, I think that's a recipe for actually uh, you know, tokenism and marginalizing uh, this kind of one individual on this committee. Uh, and so I would suggest that if you are uh, sincere, I have no reason to believe that you're not, in hearing uh, the opinions and voices of people who are impacted by orders of non-hospitalization, that you expand the number to uh, you know, five people, and not just those who have experienced uh, personal experience of orders of non-hospitalization, but anybody who has a lived experience of having any kind of uh, you know, mental health crisis or mental health challenge because orders of non-hospitalization affects anybody who has been labeled with a mental illness. We all live in fear that our agency can be taken away from us on very little evidence and with very little recourse. Um, and we all have um, different uh, opinions about uh, our experiences and about ONHs and I, if you've heard me speak, I, I've done some police trainings, and one of the things I remind people is if you know one person with a mental illness, you know one person with a mental illness. Um, the only thing we have in common is that we're discriminated against on the basis of this label. Uh, and so uh, I think you have to have uh, many more voices uh, on, on any of these you know, committees when you want to include the voice of somebody who um, uh, has the experience of of, of being labeled with a mental illness. Uh, and I don't think, like I said, I don't think the person needs to actually have experience uh, necessarily with ONH, because we, we all live in fear of, of ONHs. Um, uh, the other thing I, I, I feel kind of important to say is that, you know, the vast majority of people with, uh, who've been labeled with mental illnesses are law-abiding 
uh, non-dangerous people. And I think when I come up to uh, the legislature, I get this idea that the only people you think have mental illnesses are uh, you know, criminals or people who are violent. And that's just not the case. Uh, and uh, oftentimes, you know, when somebody has committed a crime and they also have a uh, mental illness, we just conflate the two um, as if the mental illness caused the crime. And I, I, there's, there's just no proof of that. And I think it's something that we need to be really careful about conflating. Uh, because uh, once you've been labeled with a mental illness, you're just so, you just discriminated against all the time in every realm. And it's because of attitudes conflating mental illness and violence and mental illness and criminality um, that causes it, makes it so difficult for us to get jobs, makes it so difficult for us to have housing, have partners and marriage and all of these things. Um, and there's just simply no proof that a mental illness, uh, you know, pr makes you more prone to commit crimes. I mean, I know when I was psychotic and manic for a year, um, I didn't commit any crimes. Uh, I didn't have any run-ins with law enforcement. Um, and I think it's also important to remember that, um, you know, the people who are closest to a problem usually are closest to the solution to the problem. Um, and when I think about my own path to overcoming you know, psychosis and mania, um, you know, it wasn't relationships that was the thing, unless you count the relationship with myself. Um, because what I think the real, beyond the coercive nature of ONHs, the real harm, I think the real danger, the real ineffectiveness of ONHs is that to, to overcome a mental health challenge, it, it takes the person, right? You have to be responsible for your own health, your own wellness, your own, you have to want it. And what I see with ONHs is that people have just given up their agency. They've put their energy into getting off the ONH and not into reclaiming their lives. Um, you know, the, the thing that helped me uh, most, I mean, there's this, this poem Invictus. I don't know if you know Invictus. Um, but I mean, that's really the story. I mean, that's what brought me back to health is this, you know, I mean, I do every morning thank whatever gods they might be for my unconquerable soul, right? I do feel like I am the master of my fate. I do feel like I am the captain of my soul. And that's what it's going to take to overcome uh, a mental health challenge. And you take that away. When you say, when you order somebody uh, to take medicine or to do this, you have taken away the very thing that they need to get well. You've taken, you've taken away their agency. You've taken away the fact that they are the captain of their soul. Um, and that's why I think in this system that we have in Vermont, we see people just flowing through the system. Right? We don't seem to understand that you can actually get better and never be seen from again. I mean, I was psychotic and manic for a year. I haven't seen a doctor in three years. I don't take any medication, right? Uh, even though I supposedly have a severe and persistent mental illness. Um, it's because I actually got well. I don't, no one, you know, I was told I should take medication and I refused. Um, but I, I take care of myself, and I think you take that away when you put someone on LNH. You don't, you don't say you have to take care of yourself. You don't say you have to figure out how you got into this situation. You just say, follow these things on, on a sheet of paper, and they, they just either follow them blindly and never dealing with the underlying issues that got them into the situation that they're in, uh, or they give up completely because they feel like you've taken away um, their agency. So I think also you, you need to be careful about opening up this box because you know most ONHs now are uh, in the civil side, which I'm most familiar with, are achieved through uh, stipulation. That is, people are in the hospital and they say, if you want to get out of the hospital, stipulate to an ONH. And everybody wants to get out of the hospital. Um, and so they'll stipulate to an O and H. They never go before a judge. They sometimes don't even read what the stipulation, what, what the uh, orders are. They just want to get out of the hospital. Um, and you know, I actually would like to see more people go before judges. They probably don't want to, because I don't think a lot of these O and H's would ever get um, ratified by a judge, because the people are competent. To, dis to weigh the risk and benefits of the medications that have been proposed, 
And a lot of the old nations I see, the people have not refused to take medication. They simply are not getting better. Um, I have a person who became super suicidal after she was put on an ONH, and one of the requirements, and she stipulated to it to get out of the hospital, um, and she just ended up basically going to the emergency room every week after she was on the ONH. She just didn't want to live anymore. And that's not, that's one story, but it's not, I've heard that from lots of people. You know, they just, they stipulate, they give up, they just want to get out of the hospital, and then they, they regret it, and then it's the trauma of that experience that just causes them to get caught up in the system. So, you know, I think be careful what you, you, you wish for, because... We don't know what we wish for. Yeah. <laughs> be, be careful about it, because, if, if you know, the, a lot of these old issues are not... They, I don't think they would survive judicial scrutiny. So I'll leave it. I'll leave it there. Thank you very much. Thank Questions you. from Ms. White? Yeah, I have one, too. Okay. Oh, go ahead. Uh, okay. Um, I was wondering if there is a place in the United States, a state in the U.S. or another country that you would point to that has a system that, that works, works better than our system and that we can use as a model or example? No, I think that's good that there's no model because, I mean, I think Vermont needs to dig to whatever that place that made Vermont the first state not to have slavery. We need to dig back into those values and figure out the first state to not force people to take drugs. Because I think the, the more you force people to take drugs, the more it symbolizes that your system is one that's not functioning. Um, you know, the, this system it operates too much on crisis because, you know, mental health crises, I really think that's an oxymoron because, or not maybe an oxymoron is not the right word, but uh, these things don't happen overnight. You know, you, they, there's a slow buildup. And our system is just really operating on waiting for that slow buildup. And you know, one of the things that we could do is to, to think more about holding people accountable before the crisis, right? Um, because you know, this, well, this whole thing about street outreach, mobile crisis, vetted peers, all those things, all those resources are going into dealing with the crisis. That's where we're putting our money. We're not putting our money into preventing, or even just getting to the problem sooner. Um, and and the you know designated agencies, they're not giving people, they're not utilizing best practices in some cases in terms of getting people therapists. Because usually you call your therapist when you have a crisis, right? If you don't have a therapist, what do you do? You go to the emergency department. There's so many things that we could be doing uh, sooner uh, instead of just always operating in crisis, um, which is just another symptom of a system that's not working. Thank you. Senator McCormick. I come to you with great sympathy. I'm inclined to agree with it. I memorized Invictus when I was 14. <laughs> Isn't that a great call? Yeah. yeah. Uh, I can still do it. But we can do it together uh, in okay. unison. <laughs> <laughs> it would be very dramatic. <laughs> we out shout each other. Yes. Yeah. Uh, I also was the sole dissenter in the committee when we passed the bill on uh, 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 forced medication. Okay, so I'm very, I just want to run this by because as, as strong a libertarian as I am on this issue, I've never been entirely confident in my own position, and it's this. Um, if you remember many years ago, Mark Vonnegut wrote a very interesting book in which he said that autonomy and agency are purely theoretical if you're psychotic. He said that he was in a state where he really was not free because he wasn't thinking right, and that he really regarded the force, the force medication as a good thing. And I've never been able to, as I say, ultimately I've come down on the side of, of agency, but I've never been entirely comfortable with it. Well, how do you answer that argument that when you're psychotic, you're really not free? That, hasn't, that was not my experience. Um, uh, I was the one who was telling my doctor I was psychotic, and then he thought that meant I wasn't because I was aware that I was. Uh, which is just a stereotype, right? It's a stereotype that people who are psychotic don't know they're psychotic. Therefore, if they know this, they think they're psychotic, they're not psychotics, and therefore you can be psychotic for over a year and destroy your life. Um, I think there is a point where the thing is, you know, psychosis 
rarely happens just in a split second, and there are stages where you are aware of what's happening, and then it's different, it's different types of psychosis. You know, some psychosis is seeing things, some psychosis is that aren't there, hearing things aren't there, feeling things aren't there, smelling things aren't there, or just delusions of thought. You're just in a different reality. But even in a different reality, there, there's still a rationality to it, right? Um, so an example I sometimes give is that uh, the police officers in, North, in Northampton saw this one man in a fight with another man, right? It was, he, he was seeing somebody who wasn't there, right? And he was, he was in a big fight. And the police officer merely walked up him and said, both of you, break it up. <laughs> and he did immediately, <laughs> right? And so you're not, you're just, it's a different reality. You're in a different, and the same thing with me. You know, when I was psychotic, you could say things to me if you entered my, my reality, right? I had a friend that said, you know, you should stop giving money to everybody who's walking down. You know, everybody who asks you for money, I would give them money. They said, you want money? Oh, yeah, here, money. Let me go to my ATM. Let me give you more money. And this, this homeless man came up to me and he said, you know, you don't have to give money to every homeless person who asks. You just set aside a budget every day, maybe a dollar, and just give out a dollar. And I was psychotic, you know, showing people to my ATM. But after that, I gave people a dollar. Right, so you're not unreachable necessarily, but like I said, you've met one person with a mental illness, you've met one person with a mental illness. Although I feel like I am an expert on psychosis since I spent so much time in that state. Um, but well, then, well, then, but say that, then might there not be a person with a mental illness who really needs to have drugs for us now? Um, that's I like that terminology, yes. You might want to force drugs on somebody who's psychotic be for control purposes, but that's not treatment. That's forcing drugs on somebody to control them. When you're talking about forcing drugs on someone to treat them, that's, that's those, those, I think those are just incompatible concepts, that force drugging somebody is treatment. You have to be involved in your treatment to get better, right? You have to be in a therapeutic relationship to be, have treatment. But if we're just if we just want to control somebody, yes, let's call it forced drugging. And if you've met the uh, you know the due process requirements to do that, you know maybe you have to do it. But let's not call that treatment, and let's not hope that this person is now in treatment because they're not. You're just controlling them for public safety purposes. So that's how I would respond to Mark Vonnegut. <laughs> Well, thank you very much. You're welcome. We'll thank get back you. to this business. Okay, Katie, here, you're not going to believe this, but we have some time. If you could be back here at 10 after 11, yeah. we have uh, somebody coming in the corner of the house.